Okay, we're back and we're looking at some gravity. Now this is a little bit different than what we're used to with gravity because we're going to look at how the shape of objects, the geometry of a problem, can actually cause the behavior of gravity to be different than what we're used to. Um, and there's basically three cases in particular that we're going to look at in the context of something called Gauss's Law. Gauss's Law is something that we, we spend a lot more time on in something like electricity and magnetism for electric fields. Uh, but I just want to show it here um, just to justify how we, we can say that uh, different shaped objects have different gravitational fields. So Gauss's Law is, is the formal way of defining something called flux. Uh, I like a real technical definition for flux, the amount of stuff flowing through an area. <laughs> um, stuff can be anything. For gravity, we'll be talking about the stuff being the gravitational field, okay, the thing that causes the gravitational force, in, at least in the classical sense. Um, and the, the three cases that we focus on with Gauss's Law are spheres, um, cylinders, and plates, flat things. Uh, so kind of imagine if, if, you know, in the one case, the Earth is a big ball, okay, it's spherical. But imagine if the Earth were cylindrical. Imagine if the Earth really were flat. Um, so what, what Gauss's Law tells us is that the flux, okay, the amount of gravitational field going through a certain area, uh, really only depends on one thing, and it's, it's the mass. Okay, I mean, think about it. What, what causes gravity? It's, it's mass. It's matter. Um, the amount of matter, and that there's really nothing else. So I wrote it in a real funny looking way, if you've never seen this before, but what's cool about it is the fact that mathematically all this is is the gravitational field, which I'm writing as little g, now technically the gravitational field is the acceleration of gravity, and so this really is little g that we're used to. Uh, times a surface area. Okay, that's the definition of flux. The stuff is the gravitational field. It's going through an area, and we're just multiplying those two things together. So with with these three shapes that we're talking about here, we know how to find the surface area. So these are convenient shapes for us to look at. So. You know, I, I don't want you to focus on the math. I just want you to focus really on the results we're going to get. And again, in electricity and magnetism in the course, that, that's when we will really hit Gauss's Law in a much more detailed way. Um, but the, the general picture that we're looking at, and here's, here's where I kind of write this out. Um, again, the gravitational field time surface area on the left-hand side, and we've got constants and the mass uh, inside whatever surface area we're talking about on the right hand side. Um, what I want you to, to also realize is that, that the pictures I'm about to show, any phenomenon that can be represented with these pictures will behave the same way mathematically. Okay, so we're talking about not only gravity, but next year we'll, we'll see electric fields. You can talk about light coming out of a light bulb of a certain shape. Uh, you can talk about the radiation being emitted from some chunk of material, the sound coming out of your mouth or out of a speaker. Uh, you can even talk about <laughs> the intensity of water squirting out of something. It, you're going to find the same mathematics over and over and over again. So for the three shapes that we're looking at, here's uh, what Gauss's law would look like, okay, for spheres. So imagine a, a point mass, okay, the, the Earth, or, or just a little weight or something, just sitting there. Gravitational field is shooting out of it in all directions. Actually, I I'm, should have these arrows pointing inwards if we're talking gravity, but it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. So that those lines are the field. That red dashed line is the surface, okay, like a balloon or something surrounding it. 
Okay, that, that red dashed line is what we use to define the, the area. So when you have that field going through the area, you have flux. Gauss's law would look like this. 4 pi r squared is the surface area of a sphere. And so when you solve for little g, uh, the 4 pi's go away. Notice there's a minus sign because gravity is an attractive force. We're going to say it's negative. You've got big G, our gravitational constant. You've got the mass of the object over R squared. Okay. 1 over R squared, that's what we're used to for gravity. That is the result that you get for spherical objects, for point masses. Okay. That's any picture that looks like this will follow a 1 over r squared law. Now, check out the next picture, a cylinder. Okay, if the Earth were a big, long cylinder. Now, notice if I, I'll just say we're, we're ignoring the ends. It gets very messy mathematically, so we're not going to worry about the ends. Just along the length of the cylinder, uh, there's a different surface area. Okay, so in this case, the circumference times the length is the surface area of a cylindrical area. So if you solve for little g, notice you get a different answer. Uh, let's see, I guess there will be a factor of 2 times big G times the mass of your cylindrical object. Uh, the, the pi's will drop out, and that's going to be over the length of the object, which is generally some constant, um, times r. Okay, the, the radius uh, away from the cylinder. It's not 1 over r squared. It's different than a sphere. Okay, So it, gravity would behave differently if the Earth were a big cylinder. Now flat things are kind of cool. Uh, th this picture looks kind of weird perhaps. Notice the, the two red dashed uh, plates that I put on there. <laughs> it's kind of like a sandwich idea. Uh, gravitational field is shooting out of it above it as well as below it. So we, we imagine a little flat piece of of whatever <laughs> okay, of bread um, that makes your surface so the gravitational field goes through it. So we have flux. Uh, gravity times now the the a what that represents is the area of of your flat object. Okay. We have two of them, one above, one below. So that's the total surface area uh, in this particular picture. But again, don't worry so much about the math um, and how that's set up, but the result um, will have some constants, but then you have the mass of the object uh, just over A, okay, over the area. Um, there's no little r. Okay, there's no dependence on distance. So for a, a very large flat thing, where we're in the middle of it, and we, we don't worry about the edges or anything where it gets weird, um, gravity is a constant. The gravitational field lines, notice they're parallel to each other. <coughs> it doesn't matter if you're right on the object or way above it. You would weigh the same. Gravity would not change. Um, the fact that gravity does change as you get farther from the Earth is pretty good evidence um, that the Earth is not flat. <laughs> um, so again, you know, we have, we have three different results: one for spheres, one for cylinders, one for flat things. They're all different. They all behave differently as as you move closer or farther away from the object, and it's a matter of geometry. The, the intensity of gravity changes with distance in different ways depending on the shapes of the objects. That's the important point. So I, I hope this helps. Um, and it, it also kind of justifies the fact that in, in our in classes we tend to deal just with balls, you know, planets, um, point masses. That's why we have 1 over r squared. It's not just pulled out of a hat. It's due to the geometry of spheres. So, um, <coughs> again, I hope this helps. <coughs>
And until next time, we'll see you later.